Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. Today I'll be starting a series of videos that will look at what the topic says here, revision for paper one. Now you may ask the question, why am I doing this when I should be doing some multiple choice past paper questions? Now EDPM Made Simple will not be doing multiple choice past paper questions for the mere reason that these are CXC um, questions, yes, all questions are for CXC, but multiple choice is sacred, all right? And so it is copyrighted by CXC. And so I don't feel comfortable teaching about copyright, etc. and then I'll be doing that. I would have sought permission for my paper tools, etc. but when it comes to paper one, that is a bit different, all right? And so my ch for my channel, I will not be doing any... Um, multiple choice past papers all right so you may ask the question what then what am i doing to help you to pass your paper one now what i have opted to do is what you should be thinking about doing anyway which is to revise the content that was taught to you by your teacher yeah so what i'll be doing is a series of videos that will look through the entire EDPM content, right? Please note, however, that is a mere revision. And so some of the concepts will need some in-depth um, knowledge, etc. And I have videos on most of those, all right? And so the first part of the subject area I'll be going through with you today. However, when we, we go to further topics, you can find those theory um, content on my channel you can go through those videos because they are very detailed as you know and so you can just browse through for assistance now i have gone through the multiple choice papers and i've looked at the questions and i have in my um presentation or preparation for these revisions those questions on those papers will be answered however cxc has been using most of the same multiple choice questions for the past four years. Since um, the, the subject started doing multiple choice, those questions have been similar on all exam paper, right? So I do not expect that this year, being year five, CXD is gonna come with the same paper again. I expect things to be different, all right? Maybe you'll see a one or two question, but I do not expect the magnitude of repeat questions this year. And as such, you cannot only depend on those multiple choice questions to pass your exam. You also need to know the content. And from there, you can answer any question that you get in the exam. And that is a route that I'll be taking to assist you as best as I possibly can. Revising the content with you so that you can be equipped to tackle any question that you get on that paper. All right, let us begin. All right, guys, so here we are. What is a computer? Now I have a diagram of a computer system in front of me, which is labeled to some extent, and you can see everything there and you know what everything represents. All right, now a computer is an electronic machine or device that accepts and processes data to produce information. Another definition that I have says that it is an electronic device that can accept data and instruction, process data into information which may be output or stored for later use. And this is a better definition of what a computer is, right? We input data into the computer through various input devices. Here we have the keyboard or the mouse. So we input data into the computer, then it is processed and we receive output in the form of um, hard or soft copy, whether on the monitor that we are seeing here or through the speakers, etc. All right, or we can choose to save that output for later use. Now, in that definition, I spoke about data and information. Now, it is very important for us to distinguish the, um, between data and information. Now, data is a collection of unprocessed items, which can include text, numbers, images, audio, video, etc. 
data is also referred to as unprocessed facts and figures. All right, so data by itself is unorganized. But when we put this data into the computer, it is processed to provide something of meaning to the user, and that is called information. So information, simply put, is processed data. Now, before we go any further, we need to look at the various types of computer systems that exist. There are four main types of computers, supercomputers, mainframe computer, mini computer, and microcomputers. Supercomputers are the fastest, most powerful computers ever designed. Additionally, they have the capacity to perform scientific simulations, analysis of geological data, nuclear energy research and meteorology, and structural analysis, just to name a few. They can handle thousands of connected users. They also store an exceptionally large amount of data, instruction, and information. They are used by large universities, multinational corporations, and governments. Next, we have mainframe computers. These are large and expensive machines which have at least one gigabyte of memory. The mainframe has the ability to run both batch and online programs. They are used by quasi-government agencies, local government agencies, banks, hospitals, and commercial and industrial users. These machines also have the capacity to handle hundreds of connected users and the storage capacity of these computers, based on the fact that technology is always changing, would have increased by now. Mini computers. These are computers that fall with the group of mid-range servers. This computer can run the same type of applications as mainframe computers, but just does not have the speed or storage capacity. They can support several hundreds and sometimes up to a few thousand connected computers. These computers are used in medium-sized businesses. And finally, the last type is the microcomputers. Now, these are small-scale single-user computers also called a personal computer and only have one processor. These computers are used at schools, homes, small and medium sized businesses. Examples include desktop computers, notebook computers or tablets that we use, um, PDAs we call uh, digital personal assistants or smartphones or palm top computers etc. So most of what we are accustomed to using in today's society you know will fall under the microcomputer category. All right now what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of the computer? Now I've categorized that according to four um, headings, speed, accuracy, storage, and reliability. Now as it relates to speed, computers are very fast and they can process data very quickly at high speeds. A disadvantage of this, however, is that virus can affect the speed of our computers and so we need to upgrade or service them on a regular basis. And when I speak of computers, based on what I just looked at above, you will know that your phones and your tablets also um, fall in this category. And so you need to ensure that you have the antivirus on your phones and tablets as well. Now, when it comes to accuracy, a computer can perform calculations more quickly and accurately than humans, right? It's very accurate. Now, the disadvantage, however, is that it is prone to human error in setting up the hardware and software when we enter data. And so a computer is very accurate. It gives you exactly what you ask for. It doesn't make mistakes. The only mistake that it makes is by human error. So the programmers, etc., will be setting up these systems. Whatever they may have put in as a part of human error, the computer may be prone to that. All right? But it gives you exactly what you ask for. They often use the term GIGO, G-I-G-O, garbage in, garbage out. 
right? But anything that you put in a computer, you will get. If you put in something of sense, you will get back something of sense. If you put in stupidness, you will get back stupidness, all right? But you always get something. Now, as it relates to storage, computers can store large amounts of information in a very small space, all right? Now, reliability, it says, it works continuously for very long periods and can process data continuously 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and can be left to switch on at all times. All right, so it, it doesn't break down. It doesn't tell you that I am tired. No, I can't go any further. You have to stop using me. You have been um, using me for the past eight hours. I need some rest. It doesn't say that. It is always reliable. All right, with our devices, the only thing is that you may need to charge it. All right, but the computers are reliable. And the disadvantage is that it will stop if there is a maintenance problem or it needs upgrading. Or, or like our phones, as I said, if it needs charging. All right? Let's continue. Now, components of a computer system. A computer system consists of the following components. Hardware, software, people, otherwise known as the users, procedure, data, and communication. Let me quickly explain these, all right? Because this aspect is taught... Um, should be taught in the subject era. So when we speak about hardware, we're speaking about the physical parts of the computer that you can see and you can touch. Software, we speak about the programs that are there on the computer system, all right? And it tells the hardware what to do. The users are the people or the persons that are using the computer, all right? The procedures are the instructions that tells the user how to use the computer. Data, I spoke about that already on process facts and figures that we enter into the computer. And communication is the transmission of data from one drive to another or from one program to another or from one, from one computer to another. Says so how information moves from one medium to another. All right. Now, what are the major functions of the computer system? Now, a computer is designed to carry out four main functions. Input, which is the data, the command, or the programs that we enter into the computer. Then that is processed, right? And the process these with taking the raw data that we enter into the computer and turning that data into information. And then that information, we get it um, through output, right? And the output is the result of the processed data and Storage is the area that holds data temporarily while the computer is in use. And we're going to look at these four things as we proceed. So we start off with hardware components of a computer system. Now, hardware is any physical part of the computer system. These are the parts of the computer that can be touched. Hardware includes the computer itself, which is a system unit, and we'll get to that in a few. Input, output, and storage devices. Now, these devices are called peripherals. It's a big word with a simple meaning. Peripherals are basically the hardware devices that are attached or added to the computer in order to expand its abilities. All right? So the mouse, without the, mo without the keyboard, the mouse, and these things, the computer could not effectively function. Right. If I type something and I want to get a hard copy to do something, the printer is what will help me to get that hard copy. So if I don't have a printer, I cannot get the hard copy. Right. So these are things that are added to the computer to enhance its abilities. All right. And we call those peripherals. Now, the four hardware components of a computer system are input devices, output devices, secondary storage and system system unit all right so we'll look at input devices first and these are things that you already know i will not live on them i will just bring out certain key points as i go along all right and realize i don't have any pictures of them because you're supposed to know all this content already because this is mere revision now input device allows a user to enter data and instruction into the computer they are categorized as keying 
So these input devices, we can put them under certain headings. When we talk about keying, you know that the keyboard will come here. You have pointing device and point and, and we have pointing and drawing. All right, some textbooks will give them different headings, but things such as the, the mouse and the, um, the joystick, right? And things like that will come under that heading. We have scanning, all right? So when you think about a scanner and other um, devices that will come there, voice and data entry, all right? And so we have other things that will come there, right? But just know those headings, all right? It says examples include a keyboard, touch screen, all right, and touch screen allows input directly from the screen. Mouse, light pen, the microphone, all right, that would be a voice um, that will go under that heading, right? Then we have the document scanner, right? And the document scanner is the one that you lift up and you put the paper there and you put it down and it um, scans that information into the computer, all right? And um, we have character readers i'm going to spend some time on this it says the character readers uses a light source to read characters marks and codes and then converts them into digital data that a computer can process now there are different types of character readers all right we have um the optical character reader or the optical character recognition. Some textbooks use those words interchangeably, so I put both of them here, all right? But it's called the OCR. What is this? This takes scanned text and converts them into a computer readable form. Then we have the optical mark reader. Now, this is the one that you should be familiar with. You may not know the device, but you use you use a document that that device uses, right? What do I mean? It captures human marked data with a pencil or pen marks from documents. An example of a document that would, um, that would be used by the OMR is the multiple choice tests, all right? And so you will be doing your paper one in multiple choice. So that paper that you do there will not be marked by humans. All right, but it will rather be marked by a machine, an optical mark reader machine. All right, and then we have the magnetic ink character recognition. We call that the MICR for short. What does it do? It reads text printed with magnetized ink. And so a very useful thing that this machine does is to read information from checks. So it's used by the banking industry very heavily because, you know, persons will try to counterfeit checks and so forth like that. And so this, um, they get the check, the teller will get the check and put it under the MICR, would have like a blue light and can sense, you know, scan the check to know if it is authentic or not. And then we have the barcode reader that is used to capture the information contained in a barcode. And when you, you purchase, most things that you have will uh, purchase will have a barcode on it. And when you go to the cashier, they will scan that barcode, right? And it gives a lot of information. But I can't get into that right now. All right. Then number eight, we have the PC camera, otherwise known as the web camera. And this is used to capture images and sound. And then we have the digital camera. All right, that is used to capture still images and sound. So the web camera, right, images and sound, I know you can see the person, etc. right? But the digital camera, so that will, the webcam would have been utilized by your teachers and yourselves for online learning recently, all right? And the digital camera, you know, that is still images. So you take the picture and the picture cannot move, etc. All right, so hopefully that was understood. I'm trying to go on a bit. I do not want the video to be lengthy, although it may be because it's revision of an entire syllabus. All right. But, you know, I will break it at some point. All right. So then we have output devices and their uses. An output devi device translates information processed by the computer into a form that humans can understand. Output can be put into two main categories. You have soft copy output and hard copy output. Let's look at hard copy output first. This is permanent and refers to output printed on paper. It is also tangible, which means that you can touch it. All right, so your multiple choice paper that you'll be getting is definitely an example of a hard copy output. Now, there are various types of hard copy output. Right, the main one speaks about the printer. Now, a printer is used to produce text and graphics on a physical medium. All right, 
Now, there are various categories and types of printers. All right. Um, we have two main categories of printers. We have impact printer and non-impact printers. Right. Impact printer is a type of printer that forms characters and or images on a piece of paper by striking a mechanism on an inked ribbon that physically contacts the paper. So the, the ribbon contacts the paper, so it makes impact with the paper that is being printed. Thus the term impact printer. It has three types, dot matrix, line, and daisy wheel. Although I think the daisy wheel has now become obsolete. All right, but it's a part of history, so you still need to know. Then we have the non-impact printers. Now this type of printer forms characters or images on a paper without actually striking the paper. Now they are faster, quieter, and produce better quality print than impact printers. So it does not contact the paper, all right? The ink is sprayed on in some sense, all right? So two examples, we have inkjet, which is a popular one that you may have at home, all right? Thermal and laser printers, all right? Then we have the other type of um, hard copy output device, which is a plotter. Now, a plotter is a type of printer that is used to print large, high-quality drawings in a variety of colors. Now, it is useful for creating maps, architectural drawings like blueprints, and banners. All right? So, that is the plotter. Some books will call it the plotter printer. Then we have something known as a microfilm, and this is used as an alternative to the printer. All right, it is a method, this is a method used to store computer documents by reducing the size to fit on a small photographic print. Next, we have soft copy output. Now, this is temporary and refers to information displayed on a screen, which is a monitor, or in audio or voice form through speakers. Now, it includes things such as, as I said before, monitors, and another name for monitor is the visual display unit, the VDU, all right? Then we know speakers, headphones, earbud, um, multimedia projector, and um, interactive whiteboards. So these are all examples of soft copy output. Now, quick question, which device is both an input and an output device, all right? And so my answer, or the answer is a web camera, and you can see why, all right? A web camera and a touch screen, all right? You use your phones, you input information, but you also receive information from that screen, all right? So the answer would be a web camera or a touch screen, all right? Um, so we move on, storage media and their practical application. Now, storage is the means by which a computer holds data, instruction, and information available for immediate or later use in its memory or on a storage medium. Storage can be grouped into two categories. So we have primary storage, which has other names, main memory, immediate access store, but you don't need to know all this for EDPM, all right? But I'm still giving it to you because the first part of the EDPM syllabus is IT-based. Same thing I, I teach in IT, all right? And so if you have friends who does um, IT, you can share this video with them for them to use as a practice, for practice as well. All right, so primary storage and secondary storage. Now let us look at both these um, types of storage. Now, primary storage holds data that is being processed or programs while the computer is in use. All right. So primary storage works very actively with the processor. It consists of a group of chips which reside on the motherboard, which is the main circuit board in the computer. Now, the two chips that are there um, are constitutes primary storage is a RAM chip meaning random access memory, and the ROM chip, read-only memory. And I gave you um, a, a picture, a representation of what these chips will look like. And both these chips will be placed on the motherboard inside of the system unit. All right? Moving on. Then we have secondary storage. Now, secondary storage, otherwise known as auxiliary storage, holds data permanently and is therefore non-volatile. The big word non-volatile simply means that 
even when there is no light or even when the, the, um, the computer is turned off, the information that exists on that storage medium will always be there, right? When we look at, let me quickly go back up to RAM and ROM, right? RAM is volatile, right? And meaning that when the computer is powered off, the information goes. And ROM is non-volatile, meaning that the information is always there, whether or not the computer is on or off, all right? Because it is etched in the memory of the system by the, the person who made that computer system, all right? Now, the secondary storage, so the information, um, it says that it is a physical material on which a computer keeps data, instruction, and information. And so we are all familiar with secondary storage devices. I like to call it additional storage. All right? So sometimes you're there working on your computer and you need to save some information, right? You put that on your secondary storage device. You're using your phone and it says to you that the phone memory is um, getting low. You can use a secondary storage device to help to back up the memory capacity of your phones. Now, what are some examples of secondary storage devices? We have compact disks, otherwise known as CDs. We have digital versatile disk, although some texts will say digital video disk. Of, um, known as DVD, we have floppy disks that, uh, that are no longer in use, all right? We have hard disk that is um, embedded in the computer, all right? Although you can get external hard disks. Another name for hard disk is hard drive, right? Or local disk, local drive. Then we have the flash drive, all right? And you also call it your thumb drive. I have a little definition here for it. It says it is a thumb size device with a USB connector. So if it is that you're asked the question, the answer is not a USB. And many times I see students say they, they use a USB. The USB connector is a cord, right? But the flash drive is the device. So you can say a USB flash drive, but you cannot say a USB by itself because the USB is the connector, is the cord, and the flash drive is the actual device on which the information is stored, right? Then you have memory cards or memory stick. Then you have cloud storage. Now, cloud storage is an alternate means on storing information on, a, on the internet so that it can be accessed anywhere and at any time. Some examples of um, cloud storage includes OneDrive, Google Drive, Dropbox, and there are many others. All right. Now, quick question. And realize that I'm giving the answers. I could have not placed the answers there, but could have called out the answer. But maybe you missed that when I'm speaking. So I like to give a visual for you to see the actual thing. All right. Which storage device is not an external storage media? All right. And the answer is cloud storage. All right, then we are going to move on. This aspect is something that students normally get confused. And so I provided some pictorial representation to aid my discussion. Now, the system unit. The system unit is a box-like case that contains the electrical or the electronic components of the computer that are used to process data. The circuitry of the system is connected to a circuit board called the motherboard. Now, the two main components of the motherboard are the central processing unit and memory. Memory meaning primary memory. Our primary storage that we spoke about earlier that speak about RAM and ROM. All right. So those are the two main things that are contained on that motherboard. All right. Now, we look firstly on the... So this is an example of what the system unit looks like. Growing up, I was taught that this is a CPU, which could not be further from the truth. That is the box, and inside of that box, you'll see the motherboard, and on the motherboard, you will find the CPU. So the CPU, stand, uh, which stands for Central Processing Unit, is, it's also referred to as the processor or the microprocessor. Three names, or some persons will call it the brain of the computer. All right, it is found inside the system unit and is primarily responsible for interpreting and carrying out the basic instructions that operate the computer. And here I have a diagram of what the CPU would look like. All right, it's basically a chip that is placed on the motherboard. All right, but it acts as the brain of the computer. And note now that when we input data into the computer through the input devices, it goes here to the CPU where the data is or the instruction is processed 
And from here, we get instruction that is given to us through the output devices that were mentioned earlier or sent to the storage devices. All right, now the CPU has two main parts to it. It has the ALU, which stands for the Arithmetic, Lo Arithmetic Logic Unit, all right, and the Control Unit. Now, the Arithmetic Logic Unit deals with all arithmetic or mathematical operations, addition, subtraction, division, multiplication, and it deals with reasoning as well. Any logic operations such as greater than, less than, equal to, true or false. So any arithmetic or, or logic thing, anything that deals with reasoning is done through the ALU. And then we have the control unit, which acts as the bigger sister over the two. All right. Um, it says that this coordinates and controls other parts of the computer system. It reads, reads a stored program one instruction at a time and it directs the other components of the computer system to perform required tasks. So when you um, data enters, it goes to the CPU, CPU sends it to the control unit, which then decides what to do with that information. All right, hopefully that was clear. We quickly move on to software. Now software refers to the programs or set of instructions that tells the computer hardware how to operate. Without software, input devices will just sit idly by. Monitors would be blank and our disk drives would be empty. Now there are two categories of software. We have system software and we have application software. Now when it comes to system software, there are three types. However, we only teach about the two main ones, right? One and two. And for your subject, we only speak about one which is the operating system, but um, it speaks about the types of system software, the operating system, the utility program, and the translator. All right, so, but from here on out, I will only be looking at the operating system. All right, now the operating system, some textbooks will use the terms um, interchangeably, right? So system software, some will call it the operating system software. All right. And so um, the definition for the system software and the operating system would be similar. All right. Um, it says that an operating system, and we call it OS for short, is a set of programs that coordinates the activities among computer hardware devices. They contain instructions that allows the user to run application software. Now, simply put, the operating system controls the entire operation of the computer. A computer cannot run or operate without an operating system. It is the life of the computer. And when we get down to the functions, you will see why. But first, let us look at some examples. So some examples of operating system would be Windows. So all versions of Windows, Windows XP, Windows Vista, Windows 7, Windows 8, Windows 10, Windows, right? All version of Windows, will be an example or would be an example of an operating system. Linux, Unix, Macintosh, Mac OS, which is Macintosh operating system, Apple, Blackberry, I don't think Blackberry is still around, operating system. We have um, MS-DOS, or we just call it DOS here, which stands for Disk Operating System. On the phones, you will have some operating system known as a Jelly Bean or KitKat. So these are some examples of operating system, and I'm going to encourage you to know these. Look at this list so that if it is that you get a question that asks you which one does not belong, you know the outcast. Wink, wink. All right? Then here we go to the functions of the operating system. I have it here in a diagram form. All right? And quickly, I'm just going to go through it. So the operating system starts and shut down your computer. And when I speak about your computer, you can also think about your tablet and your phones. All right? So without an operating system, our phones could not turn on. Our phones could not turn off. All right. It provides a user interface. So it enables us to be able to use the system effectively. You see your icons, you see certain things that represent certain things and you can use it. It manages a program that you have on your device. It manages the memory. All right. It tells you when the device memory is running low, etc. Right. It configures your devices. You're able to plug in your earphone and the device works just like that. Right. Plug in the printer. The printer works. It configures. It links devices together. 
all right uh, it automatically updates your device and you can see that on your phones and I'm, I'm using the phone because it is more relatable right you are able to, to it automatically updates your phone or you can schedule when you want it to update right it administers security meaning that you can set your password whether you want to use your fingerprint whether you want to use your pattern whether you want to use a, a, a code whatever that is the operating system all right it and establishes an internet connection it enables you to go on the internet etc and many others as you can see here so you realize that without an operating system your device just cannot work it is as good as dead because it cannot turn on all right do hope something was learned there a while ago so also the operating system enables us to use what we're going to move on to which is the other type of software application software your computer or your phone cannot work without an operating system but it can work without an application software the word that we use app there's an app for that there's an app for everything right the word app is short for application all right so all those things that you can get at the place to those games and all those things those are application softwares. And indeed, if I don't download Solitaire on my phone, right, or Candy Crush, my phone will still work, right? So those are application software. It says that there are programs that perform special tasks for users, all right? And so they, it helps you with certain things. All right, for our subject area, there are four application softwares that we are expected to teach you how to use right which is the word processing software which is Microsoft Word and there you know that you can do your letters your reports your memos right everything your brochures your newsletter everything you can do there in Microsoft Word but your computer can still work without Microsoft Word you can go on the um, Google and use Google Docs if you don't have Microsoft Word on your system all right it doesn't mean that you still don't have a computer or the computer can't function all right so you get the point then we have spreadsheet all right that way you go now to do your charts um and your your tables etc right spreadsheet is that that's another application database you learned about that the other day and for some of you it is a sore sore word right when you hear the word database but don't don't um shy away from it all right it's very useful database and powerpoint all right, so those are four types of application software, but based on my explanation, you can be able to pick up a lot more. And finally, I'm going to stop at this topic known as ergonomics. Big word, but lovely meaning. It says that ergonomics is the applied science of incorporating comfort, efficiency, and safety. A comma should have been there. Comfort, efficiency, and safety into the design of the workplace because everyone in their workplace need to feel comfortable all right and because we spend most of our times at work just as though you spend most of your time at school and so that no that environment needs to be what i would call ergonomically friendly right it says that it can also be defined as fitting the work environment to match the people now, ergonomically designed office equipment helps to reduce the risk of injuries and strain. Now, I have a lot of videos um, that I speak about this topic here, this aspect of the topic, keyboarding and posture and stuff like that. You can watch it to get a better idea because I'm not going to be going so much in depth. Or maybe, let us see. Right, it says that examples of, er and examples of ergonomics in the workplace speaks about the posture. Right. And you must always ensure that you have the correct posture. Right. How your keyboard and your mouse are positioned or the screen that you're using is it, it, as um, it can't say position, but adjusted. Right. Whether it's too bright, too dull, etc. The type of chair that you're using. Right. Do And we need to ensure that we do not sit one place all day. All right. Recently, I, I am reaping from that because with online classes, etc., I had to be one place most of the time and I'm, i am feeling that effects now right that effect now but we should ensure that we do not sit the same place all day right it's so that all of this put in together will formulate ergonomics and there are a lot more to it the lighting the ventilation everything now the but i'm zooming in on this part for our subject area the prolonged use of the computer can result in a range of health problems known as computer work related disorders 
These disorders include three categories. We have repetitive strain injury, computer vision syndrome, and lower back pain. I will see to explain each. Now, a repetitive injury is a strain or stress experienced in the muscles, tendons, or nerves when a task is performed repeatedly. Types of repetitive strain injuries include tendonitis and carpal tunnel syndrome. Tendonitis is an inflammation of the tendon caused by repeated motion and stress on the tendons in the hand. And carpal tunnel syndrome is an inflammation of the nerve that connects the forearm of the palm to the hand. So both these affects the hand. Now, what are some of the symptoms of RSI? We will have extreme pain that extends from the forearm to the hand, tingling in the fingers and burning pains when the nerve is compressed, and numbness and tingling in the thumb and the first two fingers. Now, there are three key factors that are associated with RSI, and these include repetition, long concentrated hours of typing or keyboarding, two, our posture, long hours of sitting in the same position, and finally, lack of rest, intensive hours at the keyboard with few breaks. Now, how do we go about preventing repetitive strain injury? We can do one of five things. One, we can take frequent breaks during any long computer session to exercise our hands and forearms. Two, place a wrist rest between the computer and the edge of your desk to prevent injury due to typing. Three, use an ergonomically friendly keyboard. Four, type on the computer keyboard as you would play a piano, lifting your fingers up and down rather than your wrist. And finally, position your mouse at the same height as your keyboard. When you slide the mouse across, move your entire hand and not just your wrist. All right, hopefully you got that. Then we have computer vision syndrome. And as you hear, hear the word vision, you know it's your eyes. All right, it says this can be caused by sore, tired, burning, or itchy eyes, headache, or sore neck, Difficulty focusing on the, the screen image, increased sens sensitivity to light, difficulty shifting focus between monitor and documents, and finally, color fringes or after images when you look away from the monitor. Now, how can we prevent or reduce computer vision syndrome? We can take breaks with a five to 10 minute break away from the computer every hour, Two, we can reduce the glare and reflection from the computer screen. For example, we can use what is called an anti-glare screen, or we can turn down the brightness on our device, all right? We can adjust the contrast or brightness on the computer screen, which is what I, would, I was just saying, so that there is a high contrast between text on the screen and the screen background. We can prevent eye strain. And finally, we can gently massage our eyes, cheeks, forehead, neck, and upper back from time to time to keep blood flowing and muscles loose. And finally, we look at lower back pain. Now, this can be caused by bad posture or poorly designed or incorrectly assembled furniture or equipment. How do we prevent this? One, we can use a firm, adjustable, and comfortable chair. Two, stretch your lower back now and then by standing up and pulling each knee to your chest, holding the position for a few seconds. Three, relax your sh shoulders. And finally, take short breaks by getting up from your desk and walking around. Quick question, why is proper posture important when we're sitting around a computer? And the answer says that it helps to protect our spine, all right? It helps to protect our spine. And I'll look at this quick topic before I close, right? By listing some health practices. What do we do? 
We need to position the monitor where there is no glare or bright reflection on the screen. Use drapes or blinds to keep away outside light from the windows. Adjust the brightness, control and contrast to improve quality or data on the screen. Sit upright, rest both feet flat on the floor. Take frequent breaks, bend several times, right? Touching our toes and raising our hands above our heads. Follow all instructions and warnings on the equipments and in the procedural, procedural manual of the device or whatever it is that we're using. Keep all slots and ventilations open, openings free to prevent overheating. Disconnect or plug out electrical cords or equipment when not in use. Ensure that all electrical and telephone car cords are routed to prevent easy flow or movement. All equipment should be positioned on sturdy level desks at least six inches away from the wall. We need to ensure that we use a surge protector or uninterrupted power supply, UPS, unit to protect computer from power surges or lighting. And finally, we need to use a cooling pad under our laptops wow indeed this was a mouthful do hope you followed me to the end all right if you did and you learned something do not forget to give this video a big thumbs up please comment in the description below if you were able to follow for me to know if i should continue with the other videos like this to complete the syllabus for you as a means of revision before your exam all right please share this content with your fellow classmates so that they too can benefit from what was taught here today. Also, if you have any friend doing IT, they too can benefit from this content. All right. And um, if you have not yet subscribed, oh, can I forget that? Please subscribe to my channel and be a part of my EDPM family. Thank you all very much for watching and see you in my next upload as I try each and every time to make EDPM simple. Bye-bye.